Well, good day and welcome to another Tuesday with Tom, brought to you by the Best Girl Consulting Firm. Barbara Wallace Edwards and Michael Walker are here with us, our regular guest and our special guest today. Our G-List guest is John Lux, Executive Director of the Film Florida Association. Uh, you remember that Hollywood has the A-List, and here at Tuesdays with Tom, we have the G-List. Flim Florida Film Florida is a statewide not-for-profit entertainment production trade association that serves a leadership role in Florida's film, TV production, and digital media tech industry by representing all aspects of the business, including film commissions, industry, labor associations, and education. It is Tuesday, October the 20th, and we are 14 days away from the big election. Things are heating up. There's a lot of propaganda flying around. There's actually another debate coming up uh, this week. And so only thing I will say is just be sure and vote. We need everybody to get out and vote. I hope things in your life are well. Uh, I want to give a couple of shout outs before we get started. One of them's on a sad note. One of my college football coaches, Thomas Pat Barris, passed away a couple of weeks ago. He was 89 years old, and I can describe Coach Marsh with three words. He was tough, he was fun, and he was fair. Terry Henley, one of our players, had a quote about Coach Morris. He says, we will remember him as the key ingredient and final brick in the wall who made our football team a winning one. As for the offensive lineman that he coached, and I'm glad I wasn't one of them, I do not believe that he they will ever forget him. I don't think they ever will forget him either. The toughness he instilled in them and the willingness to never give up was outstanding. Pat Morris will be missed by all. His funny one-liners were always a laughable memory, and he sure did deliver them, and I can tell you they were very funny, but I can't really talk about them here uh, in front of the camera. He often told me that he couldn't have ever stepped into a better situation than the one he did with the office of lineman at Auburn University. The team was nicknamed the Amazons, and we were forecast to finish number 104 out of 115 teams. And thanks to Pap, we finished number five. And Pap was a huge part of that success. Another quote about Coach Morris came from a lady named Anne Marie Skinner. I read in his obituary, I don't know the lady, but I thought she summed him up well. She said he always had a smile on his face. He told good stories. He left a lasting impression of a good, solid human being. He loved his wife, Rose, with all his heart. The good memories are numerous. Best memory was Pap dancing at our wedding with Rose back in 2007 like they were at a high school prom. Touched my heart with his presence every time I saw him. And that was Coach Mars. He was tough as nails. He was funny. And he was tenderhearted as they come. Thank you, Coach, for what you did, what you gave us in our lives. My second shout out is to my good friend over in South Carolina. And I hope you're watching this morning so you can hear this. Antley is a big time fan of the South Carolina Gamecocks who beat my alma mater, the Auburn Tigers, 30 to 22 this past weekend. Antley bragged before the game. He sent me pictures to my Facebook page during the game. And he bragged after the game. So congratulations, Antley. The other connection that Antley and I have is he is a big fan and is a member of the In the Heat of the Night fan club. And there's at least a couple of those clubs. They got about 5,000 total fans. And Antley always refers to me as Ted Marcus, which was my name on the show. He also knows most of my lines. So Antley, congratulations on the victory and 30 something years of In the Heat of the Night. So let me introduce my two roundtable guests, Barbara Wallace Edwards and Michael Walker. Barbara Wallace Edwards is from Birmingham, Alabama. Michael Walker is from Atlanta, Georgia. Barbara, how are you doing this morning? Good morning, Tom. I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm doing, I'm doing very well, thank you. What's happening in your world? 
Tom, as you can see, I'm in, I'm dressed in black today. I mean, I'm kind of in mourning. All of my teams lost this past weekend. Um, I couldn't stand to watch that Auburn-South Carolina game, but it, it just from the highlights I've seen, it was pretty ugly. Uh, I was actually over in Atlanta ready to celebrate, ready to go into the, the, the World Series, and they let me down. You know, after being ahead three games uh, to zero, they came back and, and let other team win. So that was kind of tough. And then the Patriots lost. It just wasn't a good weekend sports wise for me. I, I, I see. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you lost three big ones there. So Michael Walker, yeah. president of the Walker agency of full service insurance brokerage, Michael, what's happening with you? Well, good morning, Tom. Good morning, Barbara. I am doing well today and I hope you are too. Um, as always, I kind of keep my ears and eyes open on what's coming across in healthcare related news. And some of you may have heard this is that CVS is hiring about 15,000 part time and full time pharmacists. And what they're doing is trying to gear up for the upcoming seasonal flu season. Um, and in addition to that, along with Walgreens, Walmart and Rite Aid, they are trying to get ready in case we get an approval on vaccines for COVID. And they wanna make sure they have enough people on staff to administer those. They also got an approval from the US Department of Health and Human Services uh, to announce plans that pharmacists can administer their scheduled vaccination for children as young as three years old. So we're really kind of expecting that second wave of COVID that you guys have heard about. And I just wanna encourage everyone that maybe have not gotten a flu shot to go out and get it. Um, I did for the first time this year, I got a flu shot. And that's because they have, uh, the scientists say, and the people that study this say that if you get a flu shot, that can maybe help offset COVID because of the symptoms are related. And the last thing you want to do is what they're calling a twindemic, which is COVID and flu together. So. I will encourage everyone to get a flu shot. The other thing is that uh, PISCA Legal Services has been talking about the ACA. You know that's in the news because um, there's been some movement to try to get rid of the ACA. However, for the last four years, but yes, yeah. but they've they've tried to turn up the heat, and with the you know uh, pending. Uh, I guess you could say the pending confirmation of Amy Comey Barrett, and there's some question as to how she would vote on the ACA. Uh, Pisca Legal Services uh, did an interview and said that uh, there's a lot of confusion about ACA, but right now ACA is still the law. And if an individual family needs ACA healthcare for 2121, go ahead and sign up in November. It will be good through 21 at the very minimum. Let me say that for those of you who may be a little confused, ACA is what is generally referred to as Obamacare. Uh, exactly. Uh, I, I remember one interview where they were, people were saying that they loved ACA, but they hated Obamacare. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. they're, they're one in the same. One in the same. Yes, and they are. Also, uh, talking about a second wave. I don't know if it's a second wave or not, but certainly there's an uptick in COVID cases, record uptick. Um, I don't. Yes. I don't know if you saw the news, Tom, but uh, on Friday, they, they were state actually uh, stated they're the highest number in one day since July. So yeah. Friday, it's like yeah. there's, there's definitely a uptick going on right now. Okay. All righty. Well, let's 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 move on. I'd like to uh, talk about uh, at a roundtable discussion last week. Another college in Alabama, Alabama State University, removed the name of Bib Graves from a campus residence hall. The building had carried Graves' name since 1928, and in Alabama State, of course, is an HBCU, historic black university. Bib Graves was a pro-education progressive governor. Progressive has to be taken in the context of its times. Graves was also ahead of the Ku Klux Klan, 
a hate group that terrorized blacks, Jews, and others. Klan membership was so large at the time that if, in fact, you were a politician or a business person, um, to put it in context, they said you had to be in the Klan to win votes. Troy University has renamed Bib Graves Hall for the late John Lewis. The University of Montevala near Birmingham, one of my alma maters, voted to rename buildings honoring Graves and Braxton Bragg Comer. Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, has rethought its history. It's a big tourist attraction, one of the largest in the company. The administrators there have rethought the history of the place and decided to tell the entire history of Thomas Jefferson, not just a selective history. He was the third president of the United States. They're also going to address his history as a slaveholder and his relations with Sally Hemming, Henning, with whom he fathered six children, the first of which she was only 16. Miss Henning's history is now being told as a part of the history of Monticello. Monticello has given Sally Hemings a room uh, in, her, in the house there where her history will be told as, as well. So that brings me to the question of what do you think about the removal of the names from public buildings, especially education institutions, who don't tell the entire story? Or is there some middle ground? for telling the entire history of a building or an official who you're considering naming a building after. Barbara? Um, you know, I, I think that um, it's, it's almost evident, you know, there's a lot of racial history there of injustices and, and you know, keeping these names on these buildings is, um, really insensitive, I think, of especially educational institutions. Um, I know of at least 16 yeah. institutions Barbara, who cut out made name big changes. Time there. I don't know. Wow. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what's going on, but um, can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. Yes. Okay. That's better. Well, okay. There are at least 16 institutions that have made name changes. And um, I'm, I'm in total agreement that the name definitely should be changed on these buildings who bear names of have uh, been slaveholders, those who were key members of the KKK. Um, it, the, the, the entire history is important. And that's information that definitely needs to be um, acknowledged there on, on each of these campuses, but name change is absolutely necessary. I've got a, we've got a question in the chat from AUCBA that says, do you think Auburn will rename their buildings? Michael? Well, I don't know if Auburn will or not. You know, Auburn is one of these conservative, traditional type universities, and they really like to uphold tradition. And the reason why I say that is I read an article not too long ago where one official at Auburn said that if they were to change the names of the building, it would cost $25,000 in order to do so. And the article alluded as if that was a problem to do that. And I look at it from a different side. And as I was reading that article, I'm like, okay, so You'd rather not spend $25,000 because it's a fine or whatever to change the name of the building to make your minority students more comfortable. However, whenever Auburn beats Alabama or LSU and win a big game and all the students storm the field, the SEC fines Auburn $250,000. And I know that's happened within the last 10 years. That's happened three times. So from a cost justification standpoint, if it's 10 buildings that Auburn needs to change the name, 10 times 25, that comes up to 250,000. But over a 10 year period, we paid a fine at least three times that I can remember. I don't get it. Uh, there was a uh, comment in the chat. M, can you put it back up? Jeff Hedrick says, change the names of the buildings on campus at Auburn that are named after racists. It's time to honor truly good Americans. 
Barbara, you got any more comments on this subject? Tom, I, I totally agree with what Jeff stated there in his comment. Um, you know, there are universities here within the state of Alabama. You, you mentioned Troy, Montevallo, Alabama, Alabama A&M. Um, universities all over the state of Alabama changing names of buildings on their campus. They're not worried about the fine. And I know Auburn is one of the major uh, universities in this state. Probably they consider themselves or we consider it to be one of the, the top universities in the state. And with that being said, $25,000 fine is, is just a drop in the bucket for a place like Auburn. Well, I, I, I think I'll just throw my two cents worth in here. I was served on a committee down there uh, a few years ago where we were asked to look at the names and to study the names. And I, I think the, uh, um, the, uh, see somebody put in the chat, $25,000 is one student's tuition cost at Auburn. <laughs> uh, 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 there were recommendations made regarding the names and uh, taking those names down. And I don't know what happened to that study, probably what's happened to a couple of other studies. They were put on the shelf and nothing has ever happened. I, I, I don't. It's uh, it's unfortunate that we continue to perpetuate this, um, but hopefully um, the administrators and the leaders of the university will uh, work to correct the situation. Um, uh, anybody? Any uh, any any further? Michael, you got anything else on this? Well, I think that if. Auburn truly wants to put forth a symbol of unity and acceptance and the Auburn family, then we need to make sure that all family members feel welcome. That's a good point. Uh, you know, I think the University of Alabama has made some changes regarding this, Ole Miss. And, uh, you know, in Alab growing up in Alabama, like I did, uh, we always – had one consolation when we were number 49 and everything <laughs> that count, we always could say, thank God for Mississippi. Well, we can't say that anymore. Right. Uh, in terms of a lot Not of things all. that are happening, especially in terms of diversity and inclusion, I think the University of Mississippi has moved far ahead um, of, of at least our <laughs> on the model. Most definitely. You know, Tom, just as a follow-up, you brought up the University of Alabama. I remember when a certain governor, George Wallace, stood in the door of University of Alabama and said, segregation now and segregation forever. He did that at the University of Alabama. He didn't do that at Auburn. Somehow, the University of Alabama has taken that and turned it into a positive, and now they're the ones out front leading for say, welcoming. And most people look at Alabama, the University of Alabama as being the university that is more accepting of African-American students, not Auburn. And that's a shame. More correct. And, and that's definitely true. Yes, that's definitely true. If you look at the, the enrollment of black students at University of Alabama compared to the enrollment of black students at Auburn, it's, it's embarrassing. Um, Auburn is sitting right now at less than 5% of uh, the student population at Auburn being black students. So that is troubling. And we talked about the University of Alabama. They've actually removed three Confederate plaques from their their campus, um, as well as renaming Morgan Hall and Knott Hall on, on the University of Alabama campus. So not just one building, but they've actually changed the name of two buildings on their campus. So they actually had the $25,000, you're saying? <laughs> My God, they came, up with 50, they, they came up with $50,000. Yeah. Yeah. God yeah. almighty, yeah. isn't that something? Well, I guess they got that it from the, from the time that Auburn paid $250,000 in 2013 <laughs> when we did the kick six. And then 2017, when we beat them in 2019, so that's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So it was pretty easy for Alabama to do. The SEC probably gave them a check for that. So, well, let me see. We got something in the chat. The lack of transparency is troubling, and for uh, University of Alabama to take the lead and Auburn play second to this is troubling. 
It was another thing in the chat, M, if you can put it back up. Barbara Pitchlock and says, the question is, do we want future black students to face these names daily on campus for generations to come? I will say this. I did not know the history of the names. I don't think any of us did when we went to school there. Um, had we known the history, I think the question then would be, would we have gone to school there? Um, and so I, I just hope that the, 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 the leadership of the university will, will deal with this and, and deal with it uh, forthcoming shortly. Anything else on this subject before we move on? Okay, well, let's move on and talk about uh, our sponsor, Best Girl. The, the, today's show is sponsored by Best Girl, Inc. What is Best Girl? Best Girl is a consulting firm that provides customized leadership, access and inclusion, public relations, communications and organizational consulting services. Our clients include Fortune 500 companies, utilities, higher education institutions, small businesses and associations. We have a team of consultants led by Joyce Gilly Gossam and Miss Emily Hedrick, and they partner with business and education and business clients to promote organizational effectiveness and education, motivation, and leadership. Our customized consulting services include strategic planning, corporate communications, executive coaching, fundraising, and some economic development. Let me say one thing before we go on. Let me go back to the, 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 the other subject. I think as we talk about diversity in our country and we talk about being a multicultural company, a country, these are issues that, that perhaps not everybody agrees on, and I'm sure everybody doesn't agree. But that's why we're intelligent human beings. That's why we can sit down and compromise. And if one side digs its feet in the, stand, in the sand and refuses to budge, then it, it, creates, it creates other issues, other issues that don't necessarily have to be there. And, and train wrecks, to me, can always be avoided if both sides are willing or all sides are willing to sit down and recognize that we see things differently and that we all have the right to see things differently. But we certainly, as people who consider ourselves in positions of leadership, should have the responsibility to move things forward and to move things down the road. So let's go to the G list and Hollywood has its A list and Tuesdays with Tom has its G list. And our guest today on the G list where everybody is a star is John Lux. And John is executive director of Film Florida, a not-for-profit entertainment production trade association that serves a leadership role in Florida's film, television production, and digital media tech industry by representing all aspects of the business, including film commissions, industry, labor associations, and education. John Lux, John, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me on. Oh, appreciate you being here. Hi, hi how is everything going? Uh, things are going pretty well, one day at a time, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So tell me, just overall, the state of the business during COVID. And I can tell you from my perspective, having been an actor and a producer, that uh, it's slow with a capital. With hours, but <laughs> listen, you tell us. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, everything shut down just like every other industry back in March. And so the first, say, you know, March, April, May was a lot of wait and see. Uh, nobody really knew when people were going to get back out on set. They knew at some point they would, but uh, they weren't exactly sure when. And more importantly, they weren't exactly sure how. And so, um, you know, starting in June and then ticking up in July and August and, and things are increasing. It's a slow move. Uh, people are at least, you know, from from what we can tell, people are being very cautious, um, trying to keep crew length or crew uh, sizes down as much as possible, uh, realistically. And just trying to, you know, and as an organization, we're trying to encourage the basics of, you know, wearing masks on set, maintaining social distance, washing your hands a lot or using hand sanitizer and, and just trying to get people to take responsibility for themselves as they get back out there. 
Um, but things are definitely picking up. I mean, like we're not, we're, we're certainly not where we were back in January and February, um, but things are better than they were in April, May, you know, April, May, and June. So uh, we're moving in the right direction and, and hopefully continue that. Um, I know that um, uh, having been involved from, we've had a lot of seminars, a lot of webinars, and um, there are going to be some major changes coming down. I mean, crews are going to be smaller. Um, actors will have to be quarantined. Um, I was actually hired for a job and, 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 and well, I was actually in discussions for this job, but I had to, I would have had to quarantine for two weeks in New Orleans and then I could shoot the next week, quarantine and be tested every day. Uh, and, and so I think what we'll see is increased cost on the producers, um, which, which probably means that states like Georgia with the, with the tax incentives will get more of the business. And so I know that Auburn, I mean, Auburn, Florida doesn't have a statewide incentive plan. Right. And so will that, Will that hurt us, you think? Well, so let's go back to the beginning of what you said there in terms of, you know, how we've looked at things as an organization. So Film Florida, as you mentioned, is a not-for-profit trade association. So, you know, we're, we're not a regulating body. We don't have mandating authority or anything like that. What we do believe, though, is our duty is to educate people and, and, knowledge is power. And so when you go back to the beginning of the pandemic, the first thing that we did as an organization was uh, turn our attention to being a resource for information and trying to get people um, to know that we were kind of a one-stop shop on our website. On the front page, there's a spot of COVID information. And so whether it's uh, you know, information about uh, financial assistance, local, state, federal, industry specific, whether it's mental health awareness, there's some stuff on there as well. Um, we tried to really just be a good source of information. You mentioned webinars. So we actually, uh, in, in the beginning of May, put out a document called the Recommendations for Clean and Healthy Production Sets. And it's not a it's not a, a mandated document or anything like that it they truly are suggestions and recommendations and we didn't know it at the time we eventually were given credit for being the first organization to put out such a document in America um, it it is really uh, an educational document to get people to think about things when they get back out on set and to educate themselves you know we represent everything from you know, a, a five person high school production class all the way up through major feature film and television series. You know, we, we have to look out for all of those people. And so while some of the things in the document may be applicable in one case, they may not be in another case. And so it was important to just get as much information out there. We followed that up with two webinars, two town halls, virtual town halls. We had one with 20 industry professionals um, that talked about department by department how things needed to change. Then we followed that up with uh, one with medical professionals. We had two set medics and a, and a chief of staff from a hospital talking about from the medical side, because we're not medical people, we're production people. And so mm -hmm. we needed to kind of connect those dots there to understand what it really meant. Um, you talked about quarantining and testing. That obviously is still a, a concern. Um, the unions have come out with with their mandated regulating documents that take precedent over anything we would put out. Um, you know, but again, you know, there's a lot of non-union stuff going on in Florida. And so we wanted to make sure we're looking out for everybody. But when the unions are involved, they take precedent. And there's a lot of good information in those documents and in those regulations. Yes, it means things are going to take a little bit longer. Yes, it means they're probably going to be a little more expensive. Um, it, it would be great to say, well, the studios are just going to pay more now. But I mean, the reality of it is like, you know, this is, it's a business. It's like any right. other business. And so, 
you know, the, the studios aren't going to just say, well, I guess it costs more to do production. They're going to try and figure out a way to cut costs elsewhere. And so does that mean some crews are a little bit smaller? Maybe. Does that mean some days might be a little bit longer? Maybe. You know, I mean, th that obviously remains to be seen. Uh, the health and safety of cast and crew is, is the number one priority that we're looking out for. So then you talk about, you mentioned Georgia. And so, um, yes, it is true. Florida does not have a statewide uh, incentive program. We're unfortunately the only state in the Southeast without one and, and one of only 17 states in America without one. Wow. Um, that certainly puts us at a competitive disadvantage. There's no doubt about it. Um, and and look, you know, we're we're having a lot of discussions about that to see how we can change that. But But the reality today is that we don't have that. And so we do have six counties that have local yeah. incentive programs. We have a couple of municipalities that have some local programs. No one will ever argue that a local program and a muni or a municipality's program is just as good as having a statewide program in Georgia or Alabama or, or Texas or Louisiana. You know, no, but um, we know where our wheelhouse is right now. And, and Florida's focus really is the zero to $2 million budget right now. Right. We certainly would love to have the five to 25 to 30 to $40 million budgets, but that, that the reality is that's just not the wheelhouse we operate in right now. It doesn't mean we don't get any. We actually have two um, major television series in Florida right now that, that fall into that category. And so we, we still, are out there fighting like crazy to get them. But the reality is we're in the, the two to $5 million range. That's kind of the wheelhouse for those local incentive programs. Um, you know, money's always gonna be important. Incentives are always gonna be important. Um, we're trying to put the message out there that, you know, safety is, is you know, right up there, if not more important than, than the bottom line right now. And so as an industry here in Florida, our focus is to show people that they can come here and be safe and execute their production. And does that mean maybe we'll get some that that may think some other states aren't being as, as uh, safety conscious? Maybe. I mean, there's no way to really know. But all we can all we can control is what we're doing. And what we're doing is trying to uh, continue to, you know, send out little bottles of hand sanitizer with the Film Florida <laughs> logo on them and, and masks and, um, and, and try and, you know, through our social media, show people that we're being as, as uh, safety aware as we possibly can. Um, and, and then, you know, we're coming up on elections right after elections in the new year is a, a legislative session here in Florida. And so there certainly is a lot of discussions going on about um, incentives. Uh, we firmly believe that our industry can be a very important part of Florida's economic recovery. You know, I mean, when you when you look at what our industry truly is from a from a business standpoint, it's diversifying Florida's economy, it's high wage jobs, and it's a fast infusion of cash. Um, a lot of people don't realize that when an average film or television series comes to a location, they're going to drop twenty to thirty million dollars in a period of three to four months, usually. Mm -hmm. And you tell me a place in Florida right now that doesn't want that and doesn't need that, and so. Our, our message to, to legislators is we want to be part of the solution uh, in getting Florida's economy back on track. I, I think one of the things you said um, before we go to Michael and Barbara is uh, about knowing your wheelhouse. And if, in fact, you're, you're working with companies with budgets up to two million, I think that puts you in a wheelhouse where perhaps um, – of course, uh, any incentive is good, but but if your budget's two million or less, and you're working with in one of those counties that does have some incentive program, I mean, you'll come out okay. You know, you you yes. you will you'll, you'll be fine, really. Uh, and if in fact you're working in counties that you know and you know people in those counties, you can possibly get some other things that would 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 work in your favor. I would think. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we, we refer to things as indigenous incentives. And, you know, we've, we've been without a formal statewide program officially for five years now, when you, when you, or four years rather. And when you take into account that when the funding ran out of the old program, we're actually around, you know, six plus years now without a, a statewide program. And so we're really creative. You know, the, the local film commissioners, um, they know how to work with the local vendors. They know how to work with 
the different municipalities. That's not to say anybody's beating them over the head saying you need to be cheaper, you need to be cheaper. It's not about that. Um, but it's about, you know, uh, building partnerships and the local film commissioners here in Florida have done a tremendous job. I think that the fact that, you know, right now we have uh, David Makes Man um, and uh, The Right Stuff have both been filming uh, here in Central Florida over the last two years, uh, two major television series um, in a location that doesn't have a local incentive. And so that that shows you the ability of the local film commissions throughout the state, not just, you know, where, where those filmed, but to be creative, to work with producers, to build those, those partnerships and relationships, um, to, to try and bring in as, as much uh, work as we possibly can, because, you know, Florida does has, have things that other states don't offer. And, and so we try and focus on those things um, as opposed to constantly using the, the lack of a statewide incentive as a crutch uh, we know it's there. You know, no one's no one's denying that it, it's important. Um, but you know, we we ultimately we don't control that. The the folks in Tallahassee control that, and so we work as hard as we can throughout the state. All the local film commissioners, all the different partners that the industry has, to try and bring as much work as we possibly can, because we know uh, how positive this is for an industry for the state of Florida. I mean, you look at you know just in the last couple of years, you had Moonlight here. Uh, another great independent film, Life or Nothing, Life and Nothing More, um, the Florida Project. Um, you know, there's a lot of great uh, coming. Out, it's actually out right now. Critical Thinking is another, uh, you know, kind of lower budget film that was uh, done down in South Florida, true, uh, based on a true story. It's a lot of really great content that comes out of Florida. Um, and and so the next hope, the the next step, hopefully, is to get that statewide program. So we can take that same level of quality uh, and increase the budgets, you know, realistically, you know, and so we can get out of that zero to two million dollar, uh, you know, range uh, on a consistent basis and get to that five to twenty five million dollar range. If I'm doing it, zero to two million is great. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this. Uh, and, and, and because we've got a lot of people watching it who aren't in Florida, are there organizations like yours in pretty much every state? That do what well, you do. It, it seems on a on a varying level, yes. I, I mean, funny story. I actually got a call over the summer from some people in Oklahoma that said they they uh, they have kind of an organization like ours, but it's a little bit of hodgepodge. And and so they were trying to get some some tips as to kind of get their arms around things. Um, you know, the one thing that I, I think has been important for Film Florida. Uh, and some of the other states that seem to have successful organizations similar to ours is uh, full-time attention. You know, I came into this role as the executive director on a full-time basis in June of 2016. And, you know, the, the focus uh, around that has been really important because we're a volunteer-based organization. You know, every one of our members, you know, we're membership-based. Every one of our members is, is a volunteer, essentially, for our organization. They have full-time jobs in the industry. They, they have to earn a living and, and get a paycheck. And so, obviously, when um, push comes to shove in, in terms of time management, are you going to do your volunteer organization or are you going to do what's paying the bills? And so the, the paying the bills obviously gets the focus. And so having me in this role on a full-time basis allows the organization to have uh, full-time focus. And so our initiatives can move a little bit quicker um, when, when I'm pushing them along the track. I kind of see my role as, as keeping things on the train track moving forward. And and people jump on and off as they need to and as they can based on their time availability, but always moving forward. And so some of the other states um, that I've looked at, you know, some some don't have a full time person watching them. Um, some do. And I think there's a direct connotation between having the ability to have somebody focused on a full time basis versus those that just kind of get together when time allows and, and see what they can do together. Let me, um, I, I read um, where uh, you guys have a partnership with Miami-Dade Beacon Council, which I think is an, an economic development organization, and you have a, we'll call it SDD, a social distancing detector. Can you just talk a little bit about that? And, and yes. me, excuse me before you do, but and mm -hmm. for people who are watching, uh, 
and we all know about social distancing, but if you're on the set, uh, there is now, there are just new rules and regulations as to when people are coming up and they're putting makeup on you and so on and so forth uh, as to how that should be done. But go ahead, John. So yeah, this was uh, brought to us by the Miami-Dade uh, County Beacon Council, which as you mentioned, is an economic development agency in Miami-Dade County. And they partnered with a local uh, tech agency, Strata AI, and they came up with this, this uh, social distance detector. And it isn't meant necessarily for the production world, it's meant just in general. And that, you know, in, in the, the simplest terms, you hook it up to a computer and you're watching on a screen and cameras are monitoring where people are and they basically put a little box around them. And if they move too close to another human being, the box turns red. Uh, if they're in a safe distance, the box is green. And so, again, we're not a regulating authority. We're not out here saying everybody has to go get this tool. We're just saying this is available if people want it. It's free. It can be used worldwide by, by the industry if they want. Um, and, and all of these things that we've been talking about, you know, the recommendations, the webinars and stuff like that, you can find information on our, our website, filmflorida.org. Um, most of it is under the news page of it. Um, and, and so this is a great tool that they actually, you know, the Miami-Dade County Film Commissioner, uh, who's a one, um, uh, our first vice president within the organization, brought it to us and said, hey, is this something that we want to, you know, try and get out there for the industry if they want to use it? Um, and we looked at it and we discussed it and we said, sure, there, there, there's no harm in getting more tools and more information out there. If a, if a production wants to use it, good. If, so, if another production says we'd rather not use it, that's okay too. That's entirely up to them. Um, our, our goal in this was just like our recommendations list back in May is to just get the information out there, help people educate themselves and they can make a, a, the decision whether or not they want to use it or not. But the tool is really cool. Um, it's still in its infancy in terms of development. So there's going to be continue to, to make uh, advances in it. But uh, it's a pretty cool thing to think about if, you know, just kind of that extra layer of safety and and more, and again, like nobody gets zapped with an electrical shock or something if they turn it <laughs> into a red box, but it, it helps people kind of um, continue to think about it and, and remind themselves of keeping their distance. Okay. Well, let me bring on Michael and, and Barbara. I'm sure they've got some questions for you as well, uh, John. So Barbara, you got some questions? I do. Thank you, John, for sharing information about the organization. I would just like to know, how did you get into the industry? Uh, were you a former actor yourself, or how did you actually get involved with them in Florida? So here's kind of the, a little bit longer story. Born and raised in the Chicago area, big sports fan, as you can see by the background, Bulls, Blackhawks, Cubs, White Sox, Bears, all represented here. Um, I actually went to, and I went to yes. Purdue University. I'm a Boilermaker. Um, went to Purdue and wanted to get into um, sports journalism, actually. I mean, the goal at that time was to write for Sports Illustrated. That was kind of the, the long-term goal. Um, got into the, the journalism side of things, and um, I just had a couple things that turned me off. And and uh, so I actually, you know, I, I literally pulled out the liberal arts catalog and, and uh, flipped through and said, what looks interesting? And uh, video production seemed kind of interesting to me. It wasn't until um, my senior year of college that I realized I actually hated production. I love post-production. I'm an editor. Like that's what I love to do. And um, but you know, my my family is is accounting and finance people. I took some accounting and finance classes in college as well. So I had a pretty well-rounded education got out of college and was a, a video editor in the Chicago area, moved down to Florida um, in 1998 and was still on the, the editing side of things, kind of moving that way. And then I realized that I, I, I really loved the operations and finance side of the business. So um, I, I kind of went more that operations route. 
And, but I continue to edit now. I mean, no one, I, I certainly don't consider myself a, an editor. Like I have Adobe Premiere and I can cut some things together and, and edit some things, but I'm certainly not a true editor anymore. Um, but I, I really, the post-production side of things is where I, I really love putting the story together. Um, but I have a, a kind of a well-rounded education and professional background between the technical side of the industry as well as the operations and the finance. And, and really most of my job now as the executive director is, is marketing um, because that ultimately is the main kind of core competency of the organization is marketing the state of Florida, marketing the industry um, and, and you know, marketing the organization. Okay. Uh, Michael? Uh, yes. Good morning, John. All right. Thank you. Good morning. I wanted to ask you um, about your position as being treasurer of FEM Florida and now CEO. And the reason being is that I myself, I served as treasurer of the MARTA Rapid Transit Authority and moved up the line. And I recently was treasurer of the Georgia Association of Health Underwriters in the past two years I've been president. I wonder how your experience as being treasurer of FEM Florida has helped you in the CEO position and how do you draw a correlation between that? So just a, a quick correction, I'm actually the executive director. Um, we, we don't actually have a CEO. Um, we have, we have an executive board and so we have a president and a first vice president, second vice president, a treasurer and a secretary. But um, so Going back a little bit to the, the background, in, in my previous job, um, I was responsible for kind of the day-to-day -day finances of the company and project finances. And so when I actually started with Film Florida, just like a lot of all of our other members, I was, in, I was a volunteer, and, but I was the, the treasurer on the executive board. I think it's vitally important to have some knowledge of the financial side of things before you move into a different role within a company or an organization. I mean, like I, I believe that in my old company and now I truly understand where every penny is going. And, and that is important when I'm in my role now as executive director because I play part operations, part finance, part sales, part, you know, finance. And so understanding where every penny goes and is allocated is extremely important because if you're just only focused on one aspect of things, um, all of a sudden you're going to wake up one day and, and you're not going to have the money to do the things that you want to do. You always, it, it really always comes back to the finances. And, and right now, you know, in, in COVID, we're dealing with that as an organization, you know, we're, we're in funded entirely by our members. Um, so if, if membership is going great and gangbusters, then we have more funds to do other marketing and advocating things. Um, obviously, in a pandemic, you know, people start pulling back on some of those things. So our membership has suffered. There's no doubt about it over the last six months. And so we we forecasted that as soon as it happened, literally the you know, two or three days after everything happened in in March when they shut down the NBA and they shut down the NHL and and things started closing, we had meetings about looking at the finances between what's a want and what's a need. And, um, and that has continued. And so, um, you know, knowing that because membership is down, we have less funds to do other things. We need to, we need to, you know, operate that way. And, and you can't live in a vacuum, just worrying about the, you know, the spending side of things and what you want to do initiative wise, if you don't have the funding to do it. So I think, the, the treasurer route and, and, and kind of the CFO, whatever it is in an organization, is, is extremely important to understand and know before you can move on to other areas. Okay. Michael, you, you got some follow up to that? Well, yes. On that, I have to say that, you know, when Hollywood or the film industry were expanding across the US and looking for other places to get out of California, I personally thought Florida was going to eat Georgia's lunch, so to speak you know, because of location and the weather and, and all of that type of stuff. And I'm just surprised that Georgia was able to move ahead. And I know a lot of that had to do with tax credits and incentives. So yep. that being said, is Florida in a situation where they can maybe do niche films, so to speak, because you have 
like the Everglades and that type of stuff? Can you carve yourself out a niche for certain films? Is that possible? When I, yes. And I think that's where we're at right now. Uh, until we're able to get that statewide program pushed through, I think that is exactly where we're at, is um, finding the Florida stories that that need Florida. Now, you know, big, big, you know, big budget films, what we're finding, um, unfortunately, some of them will come down here, they'll shoot the skyline of Miami, or they'll shoot the Space Coast, or they'll shoot something in, in Orlando or, or Tampa, and then they'll go elsewhere to get the incentive. And, and so that's the challenge with some of those projects. But what we really do focus on is, uh, well, first of all, commercials is the bread and butter of Florida, always has and always will be. Uh, because we have year-round weather that can can you know do production, but to your point, yes, uh, we're looking for those stories that truly need Miami, truly need the Everglades, or truly need the Bay Area, whatever that location may be. Um, those are the ones that that we kind of focus on most and and work on the most because those are realistically the ones that we can try and keep within our, our uh, you know, the confines of Florida. I, I, I think uh, going back, and I mentioned earlier in the heat of the night, which was shot in Georgia, from about, I think, 87 to 96, somewhere 88 to 80, 96, something like that. But that was probably one of the first in terms of long-term production in Georgia. And I remember when it went away, the production went away because I think the incentive went away. And and uh, so I think they love you when you have the incentive. Uh, I, I, that, that's sort of where that love comes in. Um, <laughs> let me mention one thing I have to mention that the president this year of Film Florida is Gail Morgan and Gail's from my end of Florida in the panhandle. And uh, I know she's excited about it and I know she'll do a great job. And so so, Gail, I, I'm, I'm pubbing you and I'm promoting you here. So go get it and I'll do whatever I can. We've talked about doing some things up here. So hopefully we'll be able to help in, in whatever way we can. So, yes, Barbara, you Gail, got Gail. Gail's been great. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Now, now Gail's been great. She's been in this role since uh, I guess it would be mid-June or so. And uh, yeah, whoever the president is, is who I work most closely with. So. Uh, it's been great working with Gail and looking forward to, uh, you know, her, her time as president. Okay. Barbara, you got anything else? <clears throat> John, I'm just going to ask you if you can share with us, are, are there any major film uh, planning productions um, that's been in the works right now down in the Florida area that you want to share with our viewers? Well, the stuff that hasn't been announced, I, I can't uh, speak to, uh, you know, we have uh, the right stuff right now is airing on Disney Plus. Hopefully, everybody checks that out. Um, and then David Makes Man uh, is a, a great series that premiered on the Oprah Winfrey Network and now has moved over to HBO Max. Uh, they start production, uh, bef you know, and pretty soon for season two. They were put on a little bit of hiatus because of the pandemic, um, and that will be coming out uh, in 2021, season two. And we're hopeful that the right stuff will be picked up for season two and they'll return. And then there's a lot of, a lot of things in the, in the works, a lot of things talking. Um, and, and we're, we're hoping that some of them pan out. And, and as I mentioned, we, we have a legislative session coming up. We've had a lot of great legislative meetings, uh, just personally myself, I've, I've had over 70 meetings in the last number of months with candidates and legislators, educating them on our industry. Cause we want to bring more high high impact, high budget projects here to Florida because we think that'll really help Florida's economy. I, I think one of the things we'll see uh, is a lot more streaming. So, John, is, is is does your organization also deal with the actual movie theaters, the facilities? Because I think that that whole dynamic is going to be changing as we go forward, streaming is, is gonna become, I remember when around 2007 or what have you, reality shows came out and that really upset the actors because they didn't have to pay the union wages. And so everybody was upset and everybody said it wouldn't last, but at, at some point we've been able to coexist. 
And I'm just wondering if streaming is going to be able to coexist with uh, the, the box theaters, uh, where a lot of them are, are announcing that they're going to permanently close. Right. Yeah, I think uh, the short answer is yes. I think everything is going to evolve and, and still be pretty stable. Uh, there's more content available to viewers now than ever before. From yeah. our perspective, uh, that means there's more opportunity for, for projects, for money, for jobs. And so, um, you know, whether a project ends up in a big movie theater or streaming service or just on your, your, your tablet or your laptop, um, is not as much a concern for our organization. We, we really focus on the, the expenditures here in the state of Florida and how many of our residents get hired. Um, where the project ends uh, is, is kind of less of a concern of ours. Um, um, you know, I know that does matter in the long term, but if, if a project is gonna hire a couple hundred or a couple thousand people and spend $20 million, um, you know, they, they can put it on a streaming service in a big theater or just directly to, you know, somebody's uh, on demand. That's less a concern for us. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, Michael, anything else from you guys? No, I'm fine. I just say congratulations and I wish you, uh, all the luck. And as you continue to steer forward with film Florida. Thank you so much, Barbara. Same here. Yes, okay. congratulations on your job you're doing. We appreciate it. Well, John, we appreciate you being with us and, and thank you for that education. I think that's an education that not only for people in Florida, but for people all over who have an interest in the film and television business. And I and I, I, I think the key word there is business uh, because it is, <laughs> and it, it always has been for me. Yeah. So thank you so much, John. We appreciate you being here. Absolutely, and if I could, if I could just make one last plug, sure. make sure you listen. Uh, make sure you listen to our podcast, Film Florida Podcast, which is available on uh, Apple, Google, Stitcher, and the iHeart uh, Radio app. And you can follow us on all of our social, all the the normal social media channels. And as I mentioned, our film, our website is filmflorida.org. I, 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 we will do that. And I think I, I'm looking forward to being on one of your podcasts myself. That'd be great. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Thank you, John. We appreciate it. Thank and, you so much uh, for having me on. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank the audience for today. We appreciate you as always. Thank you for those who are, who have, um, uh, I was going to say called in, but you didn't call in, but you sent us emails uh, in the private chat. We appreciate it. I'd like to say that uh, we'll thank our sponsor, of course, Best Girl. And if you're interested in being a sponsor, uh, please get in touch with us at Tom at bestgirl.com. I want to thank Emily Hedrick. Emily, could you bring your picture up there for a second, please? This is Emily right here. <laughs> Emily is the communicator, our producer. If you guys follow our Facebook, Best Girl Facebook page, Emily is responsible for all that. I always get people telling me how neat the Facebook page is and because they think I do it. So I'm giving away my credit to you, Emily. So, uh, but thank you for everything that you do. And thank you for, we call her the communicator because she is. And thank you very much. You know, we appreciate it. Uh, you got anything you want to say before you run, you run away? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our guest next week will be London Carlisle. London is a young actor who graduated college in theater. And I saw several of his productions uh, while he was in college and he took off for New York, the Big Apple to find his fame and fortune. We look forward to having London. And let me say on November 3rd voting day, we will have a round table discussion, including the audience, and so everybody will be able to participate. I mean, not necessarily interested, as I said in the beginning, in getting into the arguments over this candidate or that candidate. But we would like to talk about the idea of voting itself. And I can tell you the first presidential election I ever voted in was 1972, uh, Richard Nixon and George McGovern. Um, I'm not going to say who I voted for, but I didn't vote for President Nixon. Uh, so that's it for today. Thank you so much for being with us. We always have fun and we hope you enjoy it. Enjoy yourself. Make every day count. Peace.